My name is Steve Sand. I am the director of the Silver China Institute. Welcome to this webinar by the China Institute. For this webinar, I'm delighted to have a, an excellent speaker touching on a subject which I think many people would be extremely interested in. The speaker is Chen Han Wang. Chen Han is an investigative journalist for the Wall Street Journal. He specializes in covering China's politics and foreign policy. He is particularly well known for his reports on elite politics, the party's doctrine, as well as on human and labor rights in China. He's also, of course, well known for his coverage of the defense and diplomatic matters of China. He and his team covering China's authoritarian turn under Xi Jinping were shortlisted for the Pulitzer Prize in 2021. Chen Han is a citizen of Singapore and he was educated at the LSE. He is the author of a very interesting and insightful book called Party of One, The Rise of Xi Jinping and China's Superpower Future, which came out last year, 2023. The subject that he is going to speak to us today is China after Xi, pathways to succession under one man rule. An extremely important subject, but perhaps one subject that Supreme Leader Xi would not particularly be willing to endorse because the idea of China after Xi is almost unthinkable as far as he's concerned for time, some time to come. But whether he likes it or not, we are going to have this subject being discussed um, by Chun Han and uh, everybody else. As usual, I would welcome you to ask questions and comments using the uh, Q&A box. If you would like to stay anonymous, uh, please feel free to do so. All I need is that if you say at the start of your message to the Q&A box that you would like to stay anonymous, please still provide information that will help me to know who is raising the question. And that is entirely used for me to understand where the question comes from. It helps me to choose questions if I have to choose from a very large range of questions. And I can assure you that all the questions will eventually be put to the uh, speaker, even if they are not being raised after the event. With that, let me hand over to Chun Han. Over to you. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate the very kind words you have uh, for my work. Um, and um, without further ado, I think I should uh, put on this presentation that I prepared uh, for this event. Um, I hope everyone can see it. Basically, uh, as you know, the title of the presentation is about succession. Um, but I, I guess to start for my presentation, I'd like to talk a bit about myself. You know, give an overview of my book before I move on to the the actual subject of of the talk. Um, for those, some of you already probably know this, if you've looked at uh, my bio page on the Wall Street Journal or followed my career previously, um, I actually joined Dow Jones Newswise in 2010. Uh, back then, it was still a separate newsroom from the Wall Street Journal, but uh, in 2011-2012, the Dow Jones integrated the two newsrooms and I started writing for the Wall Street Journal as well. Uh, initially, I covered uh, Singapore, Southeast Asia, out of Singapore, um, 2010 to 2014. I was given the opportunity to move to Beijing to cover China in 2014, and I did so. Moved there uh, in late August, early September of 2014, stayed there for five years uh, until I was forced to leave uh, China. Um, I will probably get to that later in the talk, but 
suffice to say, basically, it was to do with writing a story about Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's cousin. And it so happened that this particular story came out exactly one month before my journalist visa was uh, to expire. And as it turned out, the, um, the Chinese government declined to renew my visa. I had to leave mainland China. And after that, I moved to Hong Kong. And I was based there from 2019 to 2023. I moved back to Singapore last year, and now I'm still covering China. Um, all the various topics that Steve mentioned just now, I'm still covering these issues out of Singapore. And just to give an overview of the sort of work I've been doing, I've been covering things like elite politics, you know, how Xi Jinping consolidated power, how he conducts political purges to centralize control over the party and China. Uh, I look at issues related to Communist Party doctrine, how Xi Jinping's style of governance has changed the way the party functions and how the party interacts with society. I look at foreign policy and defense affairs. So things like China's relationship with the US, uh, European and Asian countries. I also look at Taiwan policy. Um, I've also covered um, perhaps a bit less frequently, but still do so um, things about related to human rights and labor rights, uh, things like crackdown on activism and religion, Xinjiang Tibet policies and other related issues. Um, moving on to the book proper, uh, as you can see, there's two covers. Uh, the one on the left, the white one, is the US edition, and the one on the right, uh, the viewers in the UK may be more familiar. You might have seen that in bookshelves uh, where you are. Uh, that's the UK edition, but it's, it's more or less the same, actually, exactly the same. Actually, I think the spelling is probably different. Uh, essentially, the book is an attempt to provide an account of the life and political vision of Xi Jinping um, from his birth in 1953 all the way through to early 2023, which is also the year uh, the book was published. And essentially what I try to do in the book is to answer some key questions. Um, how Xi Jinping came to power, how he consolidated power, how he exercises that power, and what he wants to achieve with this power. And uh, just a quick run through of the contents of the book. Basically there's eight uh, chapters and then afterward, there's an introduction as well. Um, introduction sort of sets the stage for the book, but essentially the first chapter looks at Xi Jinping's life up the way, all the way through to his uh, uh, appointment as general secretary. Uh, the second chapter looks at you know, how he exercises control, so how he has used anti-corruption purges to centralize power. Uh, the third chapter looks at legal reforms, how Xi Jinping tries to implement his vision of law-based governance. Fourth chapter looks at the economy, how he has reinstated state control and state dominance over the economy and how you know, business is run in China. The fifth chapter looks broadly at history, but also uh, media uh, narratives, how uh, Xi Jinping has tried to enforce Communist Party, the Communist Party's uh, official views and uh, the canonical view on how uh, the China's past and what that means you know, going into the future. Chapter six looks at you know, issues related to national unity, how Xi Jinping has tried to forge you know, a singular national identity and how he has tried to exert party control over peripheral regions from Xinjiang to Tibet, uh, Inner Mongolia, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Chapter seven looks at diplomacy. Um, this familiar phrase that to all of, uh, all of you will be wolf or diplomacy. I try to trace the origins of this particular trend uh, of style of uh, a diplomatic behavior among Chinese uh, foreign service officials and also how China's, uh, under Xi Jinping, you know, how its international relationships with uh, powers within you know, its immediate periphery and other global powers have evolved. Chapter eight will be the subject of this talk. Uh, it is a chapter devoted to the issues related to succession. Um, basically how I look at various scenarios re related to potential transitions in leadership and what implications they have. And in the afterward, I look at uh, media information controls as how they, uh, and how they've affected foreign media coverage of China uh, during my time in, uh, in Beijing. Um, the book looks at, uh, essentially tries to explain the key themes of Xi's governance, uh, talking about things like, you know, how he's exerted strong and centralized leadership, uh, how the Communist Party exerts control over all aspects of governance in society, how Xi Jinping essentially, in the book I describe him as the codifier in chief, because he is the most prolific codifier of you know, state laws, party rules and regulations as a way to guide exemplary behavior among party members and citizens. Um, how he has tried to use the coercive tools of the state to uh, encourage the development of a singular national identity, which is rooted in this grand historical narrative about where China came from under Communist Party leadership and where it's going to. And this relates to the, the diplomatic uh, 
chapter that how China had basically under Xi Jinping is meant to be restored to his standing as a great power. You know, Xi Jinping himself has said uh, in a speech uh, to, I believe, uh, government advisors during one of the annual legislative sessions where he says, you know, China, Chinese people in China finally are able to ping shi shi jie, which is to look the world in the eye. You know, we finally attained our rightful standing among, you know, nations around the world. And with this restoration of China's standing, you know, be able to exercise global influence. Um, a quick run through the things I look at in some of the key chapters. Chapter one, you know, essentially I look at things like Xi Jinping's childhood and upbringing from his birth in 53 through to his formative years when his father fell from grace in 1962. Um, Xi Jinping's experiences during the Cultural Revolution from 66 to 76, including the seven years he spent as a sent down youth uh, in Nanjiahu. Um, and then after that, I look at you know, his career path from him becoming a uh, secretary to Geng Diao, the, who became defense minister during that time, um, from 79 to 82, um, his tour as a county official in Zhengding, which is in Hebei, and then his 17 years in Fujian, where he rose to become governor, and then party secretary of Zhejiang, and then party secretary of Shanghai, before he finally ascended to, you know, close to the upper rungs, the top, top rungs of uh, Communist Party leadership, the Politburo Standing Committee, which he joined in 2007, and then vice president until 2008 to 2013, when he became president proper. In chapter two, I look at uh, this, this broad theme of discipline and control. Basically, the key word is, you know, he's put Leninism back in the Leninist party, uh, which is all about you know, centralized control, discipline, democratic centralism. You know, the party has to function as a very tightly disciplined political machine where everyone from, you know, from the top down is executing the central leadership's will. Um, and in this chapter, I look at things like how the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection has expanded its powers and responsibilities, becoming more than just an anti-corruption agency. In fact, today it looks, it tackles things like political disloyalty, in action, negligence, it punishes officials and investigates them for a wide variety of offenses that goes beyond simple corruption or graft bribery. It actually has become a tool of policy enforcement, you know, using purges to scare people into doing what the leadership wants and to steer policy outcomes. And I think this stems um, from this belief which Xi Jinping has expressed when he was vice president that you know, China needs a strong centralized leadership, otherwise the country could spiral into disorder. Um, another chapter, which I think is a, you know, of people, uh, quite a significant, uh, gotten quite significant interest from leaders is, you know, I look at how Xi Jinping has enforced national unity and more broadly, how he's sort of transitioned China away from a Soviet style model of, you know, managing ethnic affairs and adopted a much more hardline approach to enforce this sense of Chineseness and Chinese national identity. Um, the chapter also looks at, you know, the various campaigns that Xi Jinping has enforced in places like Xinjiang, Tibet, Inner Mongolia, Hong Kong, um, because basically he's employed different methods, different approaches of varying levels of uh, severity and sort of calibrated tools for what the party leadership discerns to be the problem in each area. So Xinjiang, obviously, uh, most of which you will know, uh, it's arguably the region where it's been put under the heaviest pressure with the most hardline methods being used. Uh, Hong Kong, similarly, you know, there has been a lot of uh, legal tools, as you know, national security law, Article 23 that's coming out. So different approaches for different sort of problems as diagnosed by the leadership. Um, and in some areas we've seen maybe less coercive pressure, but no less disruptive to what some people have uh, seen as their freedom to exercise their uh, ethnic identities. For example, linguistic changes. We saw in Inner Mongolia, there's an attempt to introduce greater use of Mandarin lessons in schools. And you know, I explore these base various methods that Xi Jinping has tried to use to impose Chinese national identity or what his vision of it should be and the impact that it has had. Chapter seven looks at diplomacy. Um, I trace the origins of warfare diplomacy um, and the, the, this quote is very illustrative. You know, in 1949, when the foreign ministry was first founded, Zhou Enlai, the premier and foreign minister at the time, he said, diplomacy is the same as military affairs. Diplomacy is just fighting with words. And I think if you look at that, you think, oh, actually, that's not too different from how Chinese diplomats seem to perceive their jobs today. 
so you could argue that you know the increased combativeness that Chinese diplomats show under the under Xi Jinping uh, leadership, you know, it's sort of an extension or revival of that ethos that was instilled into the foreign service right from the beginning. And it's both performative for the benefit of the likes of the leadership, Xi Jinping, senior party officials, and the general public who like to see, you know, their diplomats stand up for China. Um, and so I think it's also driven by a genuine sense of grievance and, you know, desire to put forth China's position and defend China's interests in the face of what Chinese diplomats see as Western pressure and bullying. And the, as I, you know, this is a quote I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, the East is rising, the West is declining. I think there are people in the Foreign Service and the broader leadership who actually genuinely believe this to be the case. And this underpins a lot of, you know, the, the, the way they carry themselves on the international stage. And finally, chapter eight, and that will be the subject of today's talk, uh, succession. And I've decided to put some of these uh, headlines from an uh, event I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. In March, 2018, Xi Jinping, uh, technically speaking, the NPC, the National People's Congress, the Chinese legislature repealed uh, term limits for the president and the vice president. And the headlines that came out uh, from that event was to say that you know, Xi Jinping now can be president for life. And Xi Jinping can rule for life. Uh, sort of this idea that um, by repealing term limits, he's set a stall out to govern till he dies. Um, so part of the question I try to ask and try to question this, this, this use of this phrase, I think is, you know, does Xi Jinping really want to rule for life? And um, what does that mean? You know, does it mean that he would stay in power all the way to death? We hold former power. Um, I don't want to preclude any possibility. I think it is a bit of a false errand to predict exactly what will happen in Chinese politics, but I think it, it, we do need to dig, interrogate this, the, the use of this uh, narrative and use of this phrase more deeply and understand you know, what are the exact implications of him repealing term limits? What does he try to do? How does he think about succession? succession? And what scenarios uh, could unfold depending on how he decides to handle leadership transitions. And the last question on the screen, you'll see who might succeed him. Uh, don't worry, I don't make any prediction because I think it's impossible to predict right now, but I think it's something worth thinking about. Um, I would like to start with a couple of quotations. So um, Lucien Pai, American cyanologist, I'm sure some of you have read his work. Uh, he wrote you know, a couple of these lines that basically said, and there's no leader, Mao or Deng, who can basically leave, you know, commit a country to a particular policy course. You know, once these leaders move on, new rulers will bring new policies. And if it remains the case that a leader's influence ends with his death, his successor, you know, had been able to sweep away what the predecessor did, it is only natural for the incumbent to want to hold on to power for as long as possible. And so looking back uh, at PRC history, we look at how the various, you know, the most prominent leaders uh, since 1949 have handled succession. Mao Zedong famously held onto formal power as party chairman until his death in 1976. Deng Xiaoping took a slightly different path. He laid down succession norms and principles, but he remained, you know, widely known and respected as China's most powerful citizen, essentially, until his death in 1997. And now we have come to a point where everyone's asking this question, what might Xi Jinping do? when it's his turn to hand over the reins. Um, I guess I should start with uh, some background and a basic understanding of what uh, the rules say. So to start with, let's, you know, I'm sure all of you know this, Xi Jinping has three main positions, General Secretary of the Communist Party, uh, Central, Commission, Central Military Commission Chairman, and President of the PRC. But of these three positions under 2018, only one of them, the state presidency was bound by clear term limits and a line of succession. Not that a line of succession extended really long. Uh, essentially, the constitution made clear that if the presidency is vacant, the vice president will take over. Uh, if both positions are vacant, the MPC chairman, MPC standing committee chairman will step up as acting president. And then the MPC will choose, you know, will fill the vacancies of president and vice president. So it's not like the American line of succession where it extends pretty far down into the executive cabinet. Uh, the Chinese one, as formally laid down, only stops at the NPC standing committee chairman. 
um, if you look at the party constitution, there's actually no term limits uh, set for top leadership positions. Basically, insofar as there's a phrasing in the constitution that sort of puts certain frameworks around how long someone can hold office, is that it says cadres and leadership positions are not supposed to hold positions for life. They can be transferred or relieved from their posts. Um, this was put into place after the Cultural Revolution as a way to you know, avoid making some of the mistakes that Mao Zedong famously made. Um, but there are provisional party regulations that state that officials in leadership roles cannot stay in the same post beyond 10 years or remain at the same level of party for more than 15 years. You see the, uh, the phrasing in Chinese at the bottom of the screen. Uh, but it's provisional regulations. So as we've seen with events in 2022, Xi Jinping blew past whatever uh, power this regulation may or may not have over top leadership positions. He has stayed as general secretary for more than 10 years. Uh, he, which means that it's quite clearly demonstrated by his actions. He does not believe these regulations apply to him. Um, in terms of what we know about Xi Jinping's views on succession, I think it's useful to sort of look at the key moments uh, that give us some basis of reference and points of reference as to uh, how Xi Jinping has handled the succession issue so far. Uh, one of the key moments uh, in his first term was when, towards the end of this first term, basically the, 20th, the 19th Party Congress, where he inserted this very long rubric, this political slogan with his name in it into the party constitution. Uh, Xi Jinping thought on social vision of Chinese characteristics for a new era. It's even more of a tongue twister in Chinese. Um, and then at the same party Congress, he did not elevate a potential successor into the standing committee. No one was young enough uh, compared to him to be, you know, sort of make clear that this guy is the next in line. In fact, before the 19th party Congress, if you remember, one of the key potential successes, some of, one of the key Politburo members was deemed as a potential successor, Sun Zheng Tsai was actually purged. So if anything, that made clear that there was no intention to mark out an individual within the senior leadership as a potential person to step up. Uh, then the next big event, as already discussed, is March 2018. NPC removed term limits on the presidency and vice presidency. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you who were in China or have Chinese friends at the time, they would have told you how much of a shock this came to the system. I remember ordinary friends who you know, don't really care about politics that much. They themselves suddenly paid attention. It's like, oh, wow, we are not what we thought. This, this country is not what we thought it was becoming. And there are all these jokes. I'm sure some of you have heard that China was becoming like West Korea or, you know, Xi Chaoxian is making a joke, a reference to North Korea. And so at a time, this event was actually quite a significant one. It actually was delivered quite a, a, a shock to a lot of ordinary people who otherwise hadn't paid attention that much to you know, how the country was governed because there was a sense that China was evolving into a more predictable pathway when it came to leadership succession. And this really reminded them actually it's all quite fragile and things can change if a top leader proved to be strong enough to change certain precedents. And then the next big event, uh, 2022, Xi Jinping secured his third term as general secretary. And as of now, he can remain in all of his three key positions indefinitely. Uh, I prefer to use the, the term indefinitely rather than rule for life because rule for life sort of commits you to this idea that he will definitely hold on to all these positions until his death. It is possible, but I think we should be more circumspect in making such predictions. Um, so I think indefinitely is, is more a more accurate way to describe it because it sort of lays out, you know, it, it, is, it makes clear that various possibilities are valid, it is open. He may not hold on to these positions for life, he may do so, but it's up to him. Um, next, I probably should set a bit of the, the more, it's a bit more abstract, a bit more theoretical. Uh, element of the succession issue, which is how an incumbent leader might think about the problem. And the problem, and a lot of people who study this issue would call this a successor's dilemma. And in short, basically, um, 
an autocratic leader, a personalized, uh, a leader of a very highly personalized regime, generally prefers handing over power to successors who they trust to uphold their legacy and protect them in retirement. Because you don't want to step down and the next guy turns around and destroys all your achievements. And in fact, you know, perhaps acts in the interest of people who uh, have been offended or had their interest damaged by the outgoing leader and take you know, revenge on him. So someone who is stepping down from position of leadership wants to make sure he'll be safe you know, in retirement until his death from natural causes, if he can, if, if, you know, he can help it. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you had to designate a successor, you must allow the successor to start building their own power base ahead of time. Because otherwise, this person may not be able to hold on to power. You may engineer a transition to a person of your choice, but you fail to give him enough runway to establish himself. Turns out that he gets ousted as you know, no, no, within a matter of years after you hand over power to him. And you know, essentially your legacy is also damaged or potentially destroyed by the next successor who takes over. So, and another problem with when you, if you do decide to designate a successor is the people around you, the political elite, inevitably, will start to realign their loyalties. This is something you cannot control. It is sheer human nature. The moment it's clear who's next, people will start building relationships with him and inadvertently or you know, on purpose, that will damage their relationship and their loyalty to the current leader. So this is the sort of various considerations that any incumbent must consider. You know, when to hand over power, whom to hand over power to. You know, once you hand over power, how do you somehow maintain your own authority while transferring enough to make sure that the next guy actually can hold on to the authority when he fully assumes it? And we know from past experience in the PRC history that this is not an easy problem to handle. Uh, Mao Zedong himself designated successes three times. The first two um, didn't go very well. Liu Shaoqi died in 1969. Ling Biao died in 1971. Um, in a mysterious plane crash. And then Hua Gofeng, he did actually take over power, but he turned out to be a very transitional figure. You know, within two years, he had more or less been ousted from significant influence in the party leadership by Deng Xiaoping. Um, so you could say that actually Mao Zedong essentially screwed up succession because he failed to ensure that his legacy was defended. Deng Xiaoping also had to change his choice of successor a few times. Uh, Hu Yaobang was purged. Zhao Ziyang was purged uh, in 1989 after the uh, Tiananmen Square massacre. And then Jiang Zemin, who eventually did take over as general secretary, um, that was, you could argue that like, perhaps that was a success, but even then it was not so certain at the time. There was you know, quite a few twists and turns along the way before Jiang Zemin fully established himself as party leader. At the same time, Deng Xiaoping could arguably be said to have you know, anointed a fourth successor because he approved the elevation of Wu Jintao to the Senate Committee in 1992, which more or less marked him out as the person to take over Jiang Zemin. And from the pers perspective of the incumbent, Xi Jinping, um, he's lived through all of this. You know, he was very much um, alive, a teenager when Liu Xiaoqi was purged, when Lin Biao died, and when Hua Gofeng, you know, his career was ended by Deng Xiaoping. And then Xi Jinping also experienced the various chops and changes that happened under Deng Xiaoping in the 80s and 90s. So, and Xi Jinping being someone within you know, the party with very good connections to the elite, he had inside views. He had very close up views of these uh, succession problems. And so he, you could say he definitely has a very clear eyed perspective on the difficulties of managing succession. Um, Moving on, I'd like to talk a bit about what we you know, know about Xi Jinping's views on succession. Obviously, th this is based on uh, analysis. This is based on, to some extent, conjecture, based on what he has said, what he has done, um, and what I would argue to be universal principles that anyone in position like what Xi Jinping is in would have to think about uh, when he starts to you know, uh, plan for handing over power. So we know that Xi Jinping speaks a lot about entrenching Communist Party rule in China. 
uh, that is essentially that is number one job. If you're the leader of the Communist Party, you must make sure the CCP endures. Uh, we know that Xi Jinping in speeches and writings, he has talked about this concept of Ren Wang Zheng Xi. Uh, I know, I'm not sure I have a very succinct translation to English, but essentially literal translation is when a person dies, you know, a certain governance also expires. So he, he uses this phrase to discuss the longevity of the CCP rule, but it also can relate to a leader's legacy. You know, when the leader dies, the system of governance he puts in place may well expire with him. So he clearly has put some thought into this issue, how to make sure that his legacy survives him. Um, and we also know how Xi Jinping has put great premium on centralizing power in the, in the one undisputed leader who controls all key positions of power. And Xi Jinping has also put his own name in the party constitution. Essentially, he's only one of three men with this honor, uh, where is, is the name is a party constitution associated with a political slogan uh, of a political guiding principle for the party. So that's Mao Zedong, Mao Zedong thoughts, we have Deng Xiaoping theory, and Xi Jinping um, thought, um, which is, well, much more long phrase, but there are sus suspicions that he may one day shorten it to put himself, you know, closer on a par with Mao Zedong. But the very fact that his political theory is in a party constitution indicates that he can exert influence, even if he doesn't hold formal power until he dies. Because what he says is essentially, as far as the party concerned, the law. And when you've given yourself this uh, authority, you've given yourself every chance of exerting influence all the way through expiring. Um, and I think here, you know, here are some basically key points I'd like to make about what Xi Jinping thinks about succession. Obviously, as I mentioned, this is based on analysis conjecture, but I think that these are reasonable assumptions to make based on what we know. Xi Jinping likely wants his legacy to outlive him. Xi Jinping wants to be able to choose his successor. Xi Jinping likely wants to be able to change his choice if he decides that his initial decision was wrong or misguided. And if he decides to retire, he likely wants to make sure his personal safety is taken care of by whoever succeeds him. Um, and also taking a step back into the sort of trends in history that give us some insight into how Xi Jinping might look at this problem. Um, in general, uh, retiring autocrats have very few guarantees for their personal safety, other than the fact that they somehow retain certain leverage over the people who take over them. So they ensure the loyalty of their successor and in turn make sure the successor protects them. And we have some you know, statistical backing for uh, such a view. Um, there was a 2010 academic paper in which more than a thousand autocrats were analyzed and more than 40% essentially suffered a terrible fate, uh, exile, imprisonment, or death within a year of leaving office. Their security was not guaranteed. And as it turned out, in fact, the security was highly jeopardized. In contrast, democratic leaders, uh, just 7% suffer such fates after they exited office. So any autocratic leader is very well aware of the risk involved if they hand over power without installing sufficient guarantees for their personal safety. So what are Xi's options in terms of succession? Uh, the first one, you know, he could designate a clear successor, hand over power to him, and then retire. But as of now, uh, having just taken a third term two years ago and well on his way without having a clear successor in the leadership right now, he may be positioning himself for another term. So for now, it seems rather unlikely that you know, he would pursue option one. Option two, he could designate a clear successor, prepare this person for power, and then, you know, slowly transition himself into a more like a regent role, sort of like Deng Xiaoping, where you retain preeminent influence, you can change things and influence things from a more elevated position of authority, but you allow this person to grow into the job, establish himself, and give him every chance of succeeding after you actually pass on. Uh, third option is to choose a successor, but only in secret. You don't tell anybody, uh, you might not even tell the successor himself, but you then hold on to power until you die or become incapacitated, and then the choice is revealed, and then things unfold from there. This will be akin to how uh, Yongzheng, Emperor Yongzheng of the Qing Dynasty handled it. He famously you know, wrote his choice of successor, 
on a piece of uh, on an edict. One copy kept on this person. The other copy is put in a box that's put behind a tablet um, in the Forbidden Palace, uh, Forbidden City, in the, one of the palaces where you know it's behind this tablet that says you know, Zhong Da um, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this with this legend. Uh, and this approach, while it worked for some time in the Qing Dynasty, uh, hasn't really been successfully replicated since. So I, it's also highly doubtful that Xi Jinping would want to adopt such an option. Uh, another option is simply not to do anything. You know, he can refuse to designate a successor and just govern until he dies or is incapacitated. There is one more option, which is not an option in the sense that he wouldn't, you know, actually choose this route, but it may happen in the course of him deciding what options to take, which is he would, might be trying to choose a successor, but before he succeeds, successfully does so, he becomes incapacitated or dies in office and nobody knows who he had preferred to take over. And then you have a sort of open field for the people who are still alive to figure it out themselves, who's going to take over. Um, in terms of if he does decide to designate a successor, um, there's various ways for, you know, various steps he can take to, to do so. Um, first of all, he can establish a framework. And I think this is an important thing that he can do because uh, there are implications for him establishing a process for handing over power. Even if he doesn't hand over power immediately, even if it takes time before he actually executes the plan, just by letting people believe him know, that there is a succession, time, succession timeline, the elite actually can calibrate the expectations. They have something to look forward to. They have something to expect. Um, and therefore they align themselves and prepare um, for the eventual transition. Alternatively, if Xi Jinping doesn't set this framework and the elite actually has no idea what could happen next, they sort of see Xi Jinping hang on to power indefinitely. They themselves have no idea if they can rise further their own prospects are jeopardized, they feel threatened, then they become actually perversely feel incentivized to challenge Xi Jinping. So in some ways you could argue that it's, it is in the incumbent's interest to actually let your, um, your broader elite uh, understand that there is a plan. So don't jump your guns, don't try anything um, funny to challenge me because there is a plan, it will, it will unfold, await your turn. Oh, excuse me. And there is there is some um, historical evidence for this. Uh, Harvard professor Yu Hua Wang actually did an analysis of Chinese emperors through antiquity, and nearly half of them, uh, of the two eighty two emperors he uh, analyzed, actually named a successor. The rest either didn't have a son or they used other succession rules. And based on Wang's findings, he found that people, the emperors who designated a successor, actually lived longer and they were less likely to be posed because you sort of allow the rest of the elite to calibrate expectations, you know, plan their own, um, uh, that have the, they plan their own uh, political machinations in a certain way that doesn't have necessarily involve them challenging the incumbent leader. If you don't prepare them this way, you might encourage them to actually take action against you. In terms of how Xi Jinping might actually do uh, succession once he decides to, to start the process, um, these are the steps we can expect him to take. He would probably elevate this protege to the standing committee, given later titles and portfolios, things like vice president, vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, and other positions that Xi Jinping would see fit as a way to test this person's capabilities, because you, you don't want this person to go into the job, you know, unprepared, Xi Jinping himself had five years in the standing committee before he took on the top job. And he would likely want to make sure the next guy has had a similar betting in process. And then after that process, Xi Jinping will probably hand over formal power at a party Congress or NPC session of his choosing. And if he decides to hand over power in this format, he will likely, you know, he, he, has, other, he has various options for uh, stepping back one is to retain influence in retirement. So like Deng Xiaoping, he gave up all of his positions eventually. So by 1989, he gave up his position as chairman of the uh, state central military commission. 
in the following year, the sorry, 1989 he gave up his position as the party uh, Central Military Commission chairman, and the following year in 1990 he gave up the state chairmanship. Um, step back, and but by virtue of his authority over the elite, he could still exercise control, as he famously did in 1992 with his sudden tour. He rejuvenated economic reforms, in some ways you could argue by sheer force of will, um, even without a formal position. You could follow the Jiang Zemin route, which is to stagger a transition. You hand over certain positions, but you keep others. So the key position that Jiang Zemin kept was the CMT chair for two more years, while you know, Hu Jintao remained vice chairman for a bit longer before he took over. Um, that is another way to do it. Another uh, one option that various pundits have discussed, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard this before, which is the idea that Xi Jinping could take on a titular role um, that doesn't involve him doing day-to-day -day leadership responsibilities, but has a formalized uh, position within the party structure that gives him the formal authority to intercede if he sees the need to. Uh, for this position, a lot of people have speculated with the party chairman, a position that you can hold for life, while the general secretary position or another position is sort of the de facto, you know, day-to-day -day leadership position. Xi Jinping takes this more hallowed role, like, you know, a Tai Shangfang emperor emeritus, and, you know, steps in when he sees the need to. Because by doing so, you know, if his chosen successor turns to, out to be incapable or he decides that he's not, he's deviating from his legacy, Xi Jinping can choose a new successor. But then here comes the other problem with uh, succession, uh, for, especially for someone like Xi Jinping, uh, who has established himself as a supremely powerful leader. Uh, as many people say, the most powerful leader in China since Mao Zedong. Um, the problem is when you're with someone of such a hallowed position of such authority, you tend to be followed by weak leaders. Um, this is, you know, just the way it is, uh, because the a, a strong incumbent will never allow potential rivals to emerge. People who, you know, the tall poppy principle, you know, they start popping up above the, the crowd, you chop their heads off. So by virtue of maintaining this outsized authority, you would make sure that everyone who's in position to follow will be substantively weaker than you. So the problem associated with that is the person you end up choosing as a successor will be too weak to retain power once they actually take office. And we saw this happen you know, in the past after Stalin died, Malenkov was supposed to be the successor, but eventually lost to Nikita Khrushchev. And more closer to home, uh, Hua Guofeng was chosen to become party chairman, but he was forced out by Deng Xiaoping. Another issue that I'm sure a lot of you have talked about, talked about and thought about is when, in terms of timeline, when my Xi Jinping step aside. Um, as we know, born in 1953, June, uh, Xi Jinping will be 74 years old by the time his third term ends. Um, by comparison, Jiang Zemin was 76 when he stepped down as general secretary in 2002. So actually Xi Jinping, even by recent precedent, he is quite young by the time he finishes his third term. So looking ahead, how long could he stay? There's been speculation that the, some of the key dates he gave in his uh, 19th Party Congress report, uh, for example, 2035, which is one of the key target deadlines, uh, he may choose to stay on to that date so he can claim credit for having delivered some of the key uh, goals that he set out in the Party Congress report, including things like economic development and military modernization. Um, by 2035, he's only 82, which in the current context, given the age of many world leaders, is actually still relatively young. Uh, I say relatively. Uh, and by 2037, which would be the 23rd Party Congress, he would be 84. Still around the age of the current American president. Um, looking into the other scenario where we just discussed you know, what might happen if Jimmy decides to hand over power and choose a successor, if he you know, what happens if this doesn't work out? Either he doesn't choose one or he fails to choose one in time. Um, I personally would argue that Xi Jinping is more inclined to choose a successor than not. The reason being, it is your number one prerogative as an incumbent leader. Um, it is, I, 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 I can't see of any reasonable argument for an incumbent to give up this power 
to say, I don't need to choose a successor. I'll leave it up to them to decide who should follow me. Because I think this, this is the number one thing you can do to defend your legacy. So you will not give up this prerogative easily. The problem is, uh, given what we described just now, the various factors, he may struggle to choose suitable heirs because they're all too weak or he doesn't think they're strong enough to defend his legacy. Um, Xi Jinping may end up exiting office uh, unplanned, either through death or incapacitation before he chooses uh, uh, someone to take over him. Um, associated with this, I'm sure you've indulged, all of us indulged in such parlor games, which is uh, monitoring the health of the incumbent leader. Um, everyone has, you know, poked apart things like Xi Jinping coughing too much during a speech. Xi Jinping, you know, was seen sort of limping when he was doing a state visit to France and Italy in 2019. And like, people started speculating, did he have a physical ailment? Um, and obviously, famously in 2012, before he took power, he disappeared for two weeks. He canceled a meeting with Clinton uh, and other dignitaries that were supposed to meet him during this two-week period. And it was never really explained what he did in those two weeks. Uh, in essence, uh, all these episodes remind us that Xi Jinping represents key person risk on a global scale. Um, and this is also another reason why we need to think very carefully about succession issues because, you know, company, a big company fails in succession, you know, shareholders might get affected. Xi Jinping, you know, leading one of the world's most populous countries, most powerful militaries, second largest economy. If he mishandles succession, the implications are truly global. So looking at potential scenarios for uh, unexpected or unplanned exit. Um, if the incumbent leader through illness or accident is no longer able to do his job, these are potential outcomes. Uh, the government may fall into limbo where, where the existing officials, they sort of hedge between whether he can come back or he might die. Um, this actually played out very dramatically. If you watched the movie in 2017, uh, made by Armando Iannucci, who also made Veep and the Thick of It. He's a brilliant satirist. The movie The Death of Stalin sort of dramatized this process very vividly, where after Stalin uh, collapses from a stroke, the, the, the inner circle was sort of squabbling among themselves. You know, what should they get doctors? You know, who should they call? Should they get a good doctor? But actually they realized there were no good doctors left because they purged them all. You know, and they were worried that if they got a bad doctor in, Stalin might find out. And they realized if, if he dies, then he'll never find out, you know, things like that. It, obviously, that's a bit of a satirical take on what might happen. But in real life, who is to say a similar process might not happen? Um, in the, this political limbo we just described, you know, latent fissures within the elite might erupt, you know. The party is a broad church. There are different groups of people with different persuasions in the party. Although currently we may not see any things remotely uh, uh, sort of like the, the, the sort of factionalism paradigm I think is, is outdated. But you know, there are still different people with different beliefs of various degrees. They have different persuasions. They may in a time of crisis like this start to coalesce into different groups and each group may have a preferred successor. And then you have sort of a infighting that could emerge. During this process, uh, key coercive apparatus will become important. The military and internal security services will likely play a crucial role in deciding who wins. We saw this happen in 1976 when uh, the Central Guards Bureau that was in charge of leadership security took a side. They, they, they basically helped Huapo from arrest the gang of four. So that was a bloodless coup, so to speak. Um, where you know people in charge of certain coercive tools of state played a crucial role in deciding who wins a power struggle. And another personal outcome is where sideline officials may see this as an opportunity to come back into power, you know, because the leader is incapacitated or dead. This is their chance to you know get back into the fight. Uh, moving on to this is purely analysis and speculation now. So take this with a pinch of salt, take this with, you know, uh, for just, just as a guide, you know, this, I'm not making any predictions. I think it's uh, making any predictions at this stage is setting ourselves, setting yourself up for failure. But in terms of who's next, uh, the current standing committee, um, as you would see, due to various reasons I've listed on this, the screen, they're too old. 
right? Uh, or they don't have the necessary experience. Therefore, they're all sort of not seen as the natural possibility of successor. Li Chang was only six years younger than she. Zhao Lezi is only two, uh, four years younger than she. Wang Huling only two years younger than she. Tai Chi as well. Ding Xuexiang is the one with the biggest age gap to Xi, but he has never governed a region, right? He has, the, in this sense, uh, he lacks a key prerequisite for taking on national office. You could argue like right now he's vice premier, executive vice premier. So he has experience that he's accumulating right now uh, at the central leadership level, but it's still quite a different job to what it would have been like. He didn't have that pathway uh, taking on jobs of increasing importance to the regions. So it could be a strike against him. Li Xi is also too old. Looking uh, broader into the rest of the Politburo, we have a lot of people, uh, Liu Lingho, the post 60s. Uh, here's a list of them. Um, but you still struggle to see among them a clear successor. Uh, not to say that one might not emerge in time to come, but one thing I like to put in your heads is this idea that it is possible that this crop of leaders may also be passed over. Because if Xi Jinping was to retain power for a significant time to come beyond a third, beyond a fourth term, then these people would also become too old to take over. Um, the age gap will be too short. Um, even if they do take over, they will also not last in power for particularly long. So it may, it may be more wise for Xi Jinping to actually choose someone even younger and start the grooming process now. If you groom uh, someone in the post 70s generation, for example, this person will be even more beholden to Xi Jinping because his rise in the upper tiers of the party leadership will be completely under the patronage of Xi. So in that sense, Xi Jinping may more, feel more secure in knowing that this person from a younger generation is truly his guy. Uh, that could be a factor. Um, again, this is speculation. This is just educated guesses. You're entitled to your own opinion. Uh, you may have better guesses than me, but you know, just want to lay out uh, sort of the thinking of some of the thinking I've done about this uh, issue. And with that, I conclude my presentation and I'm willing to take questions now. Thank you very much indeed. Um... Chunhan, absolutely fascinating. And I'm particularly grateful to you for your uh, courage to look into the crystal ball for the potential successors. Now, I'm sure others have many questions to ask you, but let me start off by asking you this. You have outlined all kinds of reasons why Xi Jinping really should want to have a successor is a power that he should not and there's no reason for him to want to forsake but have you seen any actual evidence to suggest that he is a himself thinking about eventually he will need a successor and b that of any of your generations that he's looking at including the generations to be groomed, that there is the possibility of anybody who is great enough to merit being his successor. For he is, after all, the greatest of them all since 1949. There's no leader greater than Xi Jinping, not even Mao, certainly not Deng Xiaoping, let alone your Zhang Jimin and Hu Jintao's of this world. Who could fit that big shoes? What are his thoughts on that? What are the evidence that he has even al allowed that thought to be contemplated by him or anybody else? Um, on the first question, I think uh, obviously Xi Jinping hasn't said all that much specifically about his own succession planning in public. Uh, but I think he must, it is an issue that in some ways when you become the leader, of any major organization or country, it is one of the key things you start thinking about, you know, your legacy and what's next. Because uh, especially when you set yourself up, as Xi Jinping has done, uh, to be seen, you want to be respected as a great statesman, someone of consequence, a consequential leader who's taken China onto a new path, um, someone, an epoch-defining leader who can be compared with Mao and Deng. 
uh, he is someone who clearly thinks a lot about his legacy and it is sort of inseparable for someone to think about his legacy, uh, you know, and he therefore has to also think about succession because you cannot separate the two. Uh, there's no way to think about protecting and building as protecting a legacy without thinking about how do you protect it after you die. Um, so I think obviously Xi Jinping hasn't actually said it publicly himself, how I want to handle succession or that, you know, I hadn't thinking about succession, but I think it is uh, a given that he would be given how he has, you know, sort of positioned himself, promoted himself, positioned himself to be one of great men of history. And for, for that status to endure, uh, he has to do something within his power. He may or may not succeed, but I think from his position, he should at least have to try to make sure the succession is well handled enough for his legacy to survive. He also has said, in terms of what he has said publicly, he has said things like, you know, the, the, the longevity of the party rule, uh, longevity of Communist Party control over China is dependent on us grooming you know, successions of generations upon generations of worthy Communist Party members. So he's, he says it in a broad sense that, you know, the party must continue to renew itself to ensure fresh blood comes in. They are worthy of becoming Communist Party members. They can take the mission forward. They can continue to govern China well into the future to ensure the CCP endures. Uh, that is a very macro uh, perspective, but I think, you know, in, embedded within that is understanding that he himself in his position he must also think about his succession to the next general secretary or whatever position, whatever that position may soon to be, may become to be called. Um, sorry, what was the second question? No, no, I think, I think, I think, I think, I think we are moving. I mean, I was really asking about actual evidence that he actually yeah. would be willing to contemplate that. Yeah, sure. Um, let's, let's, let's move on because there are, uh, quite a few questions in the box already. One of them, the first one I picked, it comes from Matthew Kennedy at Warwick University. And he wanted to ask you about something that you have not touched on in your talk, mm -hmm. which is the role that the PLA plays in any future succession process. Mm -hmm. What role would that be? So it sort of depends on, you know, whether it's a planned succession or uh, unplanned, you know, succession where we don't even have a clear or a sort of heir apparent in position. So if it's a planned succession, then the role the PLA would play would be much more meaningful. It would ensure the process plays out as intended. They would be it's, it's, it's the custodians. They'll be the, you know, the, the, the guarantors of the process as they've always been, they are the ultimate guarantor of Communist Party power, um, but they don't have to do any active role. Um, they just have to make sure the process unfolds as it's meant to be, as the leadership had designed. Um, so in that sense, they don't actually have to do much, but in the event of a contested succession, an unplanned succession, then um, their, their role potentially becomes very pivotal. As mentioned just now, the example in 1976, uh, where the Joanne Jiwiji actually played a uh, arguably, you know, crucial role in deciding the outcome of the purge of the Gang of Four. Uh, the military can play a significant role in deciding who wins because by pledging their loyalty to a particular would-be successor, you know, you give this person almost 100% certainty of success because they control the most important tool of power in the country. Um, in fact, if you remember, uh, some of my colleagues, this was back in 2012, I believe, when we were covering the downfall of Bo Xilai. Uh, Bo Xilai uh, obviously was purged, ultimately convicted and jailed for life for corruption and abuse of power. But it turned out uh, through my colleagues reporting that before he was purged, there was one visit that he made to a PLA base in the Southwest uh, where his father was, you know, had roots he had connections to this particular PLA unit. And he was seen as courting uh, that sort of, you know, sort of tapping that history, using that family connection to sort of build this relationship or to flaunt this relationship that he has with this particular PLA unit. And that was a big no-no for the, the Communist Party leadership because no more factualism, they've seen that happen. Uh, arguably the worst manifestations of that happened in Cultural Revolution where there were 
you could argue instances of outright civil war between you know different uh, armed groups including PLA units so there was there's this understanding that you cannot allow you know upstarts you know, wannabe you know leaders to try to use the PLA in a way that that other than is truly intended for which is to guarantee party power you cannot use it as you know uh, as, as a sort of tool to sort of usurp power or try to protect yourself against the central party leadership trying to purge you. So I think that 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 episode reminded a lot of people the risk, you know, and and the influence influence that the PLA does have any potential power struggle within the party. Okay, next question I think comes from Madrid, the Autonoma University of Madrid, from uh, Blanca Morabini Saint Martin, and the question is about the leading small groups. Now, some of them been renamed, but they fundamentally mm -hmm. been leading mm -hmm. small groups. And the question is, how can we seek to understand their influence on Chinese policy process when they are so opaque and thus greatly limiting access to empirical evidence? What strategies do you have for overcoming the problems of access to data about the leading small groups. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, um, there's a reason why I wrote, uh, if, if you remember, I mentioned the start of the presentation, I had an afterword, which talks about media and information controls. I actually discussed this problem of opacity and lack of access to information in that section of the book. Basically, uh, I'm not sure we can overcome this problem, but we can try to, you know, peel away at some of the uh, walls that have, the party has erected. We can try to find cracks here and there to get information, but I don't think we can truly overcome this problem. Uh, it is a challenge that, arguably, as long as these, as long as the party remains a Leninist party, and there's no reason to think if it exists and remains in power, it wouldn't be a Leninist party. Uh, it will have erect these walls, and a lot of these walls be highly impenetrable. We can only do our best to try to peer over or somehow get some people inside the wall to offer us some more insights as to what's going on within the, the leadership. Uh, as mentioned, you know, central leading groups, some of them have reading commissions. They are, there's all, very little visibility into what they do. Uh, they have routine disclosures, like sometimes they will tell you they have met, who, who, who are the key attendees. They'll give you a readout as to what they've you know, decided. But this is as much often as much as it gets, and unfortunately, we're sort of going back to the era of, you know, the Mao era, where a lot of the China watching was done from the outside. And back then, it was done out of Hong Kong. Uh, a lot of people would basically read the People's Daily religiously every day, to the extent that it is second nature to you. You understand the language that the party uses to communicate to its people as well as they do. And then you pick up on very minute and small changes in inflections and tone and a vocabulary that gives you, you know, this uh, inkling that things are changing. There's a policy shift or you notice things like so-and-so hasn't appeared in any of these public reports for six months, what's happened to him. In fact, that's what we've been doing in some, to some extent. Like we've noticed things like, you know, when Qing Gang and Li Shangfu disappeared. Uh, when Wei Feng He stopped showing up in public after retired, and that he was not seen in this list of, you know, retired state and party leaders who were received Chinese neo well wishes, that's the sort of analysis we're doing again because we have very few other ways of trying to get direct information. But ultimately, the party is a 98 million member party. It controls a bureaucracy of huge size, governing a part, uh, governing a country of 1.4 million people. There's certain directives and instructions that can be disseminated internally to uh, what we call Hong Wenjian and secret documents. But there's a lot of things that can be and has to be communicated in the clear, in public, through the People's Daily, through Xinhua, through publications uh, like the Qiu Shi Journal, through books, through um, educational, political education material for party members to study. A lot of what the leadership wants people to think down the chain, that is actually accessible to us. And if I guess the only solution or the only approach that's left to us as outsiders is to be better trained and better adapt into picking up signals that some of them would emerge in these outward facing public documentations that are put out. So open source research essentially is the only uh, 
solution I can offer. Okay. Next questions come from an anonymous participant. Not entirely sure why the question is being uh, put in an anonymous way, but here goes. Why is it helpful to compare Xi's regime with pre-modern Chinese emperors in terms of your succession uh, arrangements? Yeah, so I think, uh, well, I wouldn't want to compare, broaden the comparison too much. I did use um, the Qing dynasty, specifically Yongzheng, in the final, the last chapter eight of my book to talk about succession because um, imperial drama, imperial succession dramas is are very well known among Chinese people. Uh, is these legends are you know taught in schools? It is portrayed in television dramas. Uh, some of you who uh, if you're old enough, you would have seen some of these television dramas in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, put the CTV dramas portraying the three most famous emperors of the Qing dynasty. Kangxi, Yongzheng, Qianlong. There were epic CTV dramas for each emperor. And Yongzheng, I remember when I watched that, I was very taken by its depiction of the of this episode known as the Zhu Wang Duodi, you know, the nine princes fighting for the throne. You know, it's very bloody, internecine, you know, fratricidal fighting among princes to fight over who would take over. Obviously, Yongzheng was the one who won. Um, but, you know, this stuff is legend. This stuff is well understood by the man in the street. Everyone has heard these stories. They understand, you know, Gong Dou If you remember, actually, a few years ago, there was a Yan Xi Gong Lue, this famous television show about, you know, court politics. I think a lot of honorary Chinese people actually... That's imperial history gives them that sort of understanding, you know, how core politics works, how succession uh, is a problem for autocratic rulers of China's imperial past. And there are, there are some parallels. And I think even current leaders, even people within the party elite also think of themselves uh, in those terms to some extent, in the sense that their understanding of Chinese history also informs how they see events of today. Um, you know, some of the people who criticize Xi for what he's done since taking power, those are his friends. You know, I, I you know, prince, fellow princelings who uh, point out to, you know, in conversations I've had with some of them, like they, 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 they are, you know, they, they make certain analogies. They, they use that sort of language and invoke those sort of uh, parallels. So it is something that they think about, you know, uh, it informs them, it shapes their worldview, it shapes how they look at politics and tradition. So in the reason why I make this comparison is because it's also to some extent how they think about this issue. You know, it's not necessarily directly comparable because obviously there's key differences in how the party is run and how a monarchy is run. Uh, there are a lot of influences and examples and lessons they would have learned from how Soviet political succession was handled and how Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping handled succession. But in the grander scheme of things, the imperial history does play a role in shaping how they think of some of these issues. In fact, some of their you know, self-image as well. I think. So effectively, you are saying that the system may have changed. The mindset for thinking about power struggle and succession in China has not fundamentally changed from the imperial dynastic days to the socialist Communist Party era. Uh, in some ways, yes. And, uh, ironically, so uh, because that was the sort of Feng Tian, you know, feudal system is meant to overthrow. But um, the power structures, as they are designed, unfortunately, there's, there are parallels, and I think it would be it would be remiss of us not to look at some of these parallels. Obviously, understanding the limitations of such comparisons, we have to be careful about you know taking drawing too straight of a line between imperial history and what's happening today, but there are parallels. It does shape how some of them look at these issues within the elite. So, you know, even if it's just like the sort of analogies they reach for, the sort of in historical examples that they reach for, you know, it's a shorthand, right? Like when I say this particular emperor did this, you know, a lot of people in, uh, who understand Chinese politics within the system, they understand what you mean. You know, when I say Zhu Yuanzhang, you know, as, uh, the, the thing of when Li, uh, uh, Li Chang said he wouldn't, well, we have announced that Li Chang wouldn't do a press conference at the end of Liang Hui just a couple of weeks ago. A lot of Chinese netizens, they went online and made 
you know, oblique commentary. And one of the ways they made oblique commentary about this cancellation of the press briefing was they posted a video of a drama series about Zhu and Zhang. And this, 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 the clip that they posted was Zhu and Zhang basically scolding a courtier saying, I don't want, you know, a chancellor, a prime minister. I don't need one. I can control things myself. You know, that's the sort of analogies and historical examples that they reach for because it's familiar to them. They see certain parallels, you know, and it, it helps them understand what's going on and explain what's going on. So even though there's key differences, but I think there's enough similarities that, you know, people consistently reach back into imperial history to make a critique of what's going on today. Okay, let's move on. Uh, James Sinclair has a question, which is about how did Xi Jinping persuade the party in 2018 to agree, or 2017 to, to agree to the end of the term limits for himself? I think it was 20, yeah. Yeah, so this was done uh, as far as the public record shows, this was done at the plenum. One of the, you know, so there were two plenums before the 2018 uh, Yanghui where the term limits were scrapped. And if you remember, actually, the announcement was came out in a very weird way. It actually uh, came out in a Xinhua tweet or headline where it says in English that the term limit had been scrapped. The Chinese reports on the, the proposed changes in the constitution actually soft pedaled this, uh, this bombshell. It was the English Xinhua that actually told the world like almost in the clear, like, oh, this is happening. And people you know, reacted accordingly. Um, in terms of how he did it, uh, this is something where, you know, this, it's hard to know because obviously we're not there. We, 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 we have limited insight into such decision-making processes. But I think there's some, some interesting signs that you can take away from how the process unfolded, which is interestingly for something so monumental, uh, given the impact that it had on public discourse in the years since and the shock it made, the shock it delivered to a lot of people at the time when it was announced, uh, it wasn't leaked, right? It was such a monumental decision, but there was no one actually really talked about it before it happened. Um, and you look, for example, the plenum, uh, uh, basically a congregation of 370 plus people, including alternate members of the Central Committee. I always tell this, I mean, this is just a, a more facetious way to make this point. So don't take it too seriously. Um, the driver, uh, you know, every, every central committee member has a driver. On the way home from the meeting, you tell your driver, you know, you tell your secretary, maybe you tell your wife. So 370 times four, you know, more than a thousand people, maybe close to, you know, 2000 people, in fact, might have heard of something about along the lines that something this big would happen, but it wasn't leaked. It only became public information at the moment when the party released the information. That tells you that um, Xi Jinping has done a very uh, good job at information security. He's convinced you know, people to protect the party's secrets, you know, especially a sensitive secret like that. Thing, something which if prematurely released could have caused backlash and jeopardized his attempt to repeal the term limit. But it was held very closely. It came out only when the party was prepared to release it. And I think that shows the level of um, control and secrecy he has been able to enforce at that point to make sure there was discipline in the upper ranks that you know, this key decision, this arguably you know, uh, uh, a, a moment in Chinese political history that you know, sort of defined the difference between you know, the, a sort of clear turning point between the Deng era and the Xi era. Um, I think the question, the thrust of the question really is about why did the party upper echelon, whether you're talking about the Central Committee or the Politburo, why did they go along with it when it was being put forward, rather than resist it at the yeah. first moment it came out? I think that's yeah. really the thrust of the question. Yeah. So I think what I was trying to make, my, the point I was trying to make uh, obliquely from what I meant about the information security was that he had this control over the central leadership. You know, they, they didn't get to go out of line. The fact that you could enforce such tight information security, I think is a symptom or is a reflection of the sort of the hold he had already established over the party leadership. 
the, the party elite, the, the, the 370 people that constitute the central committee. None of them that a step out of line. None of them try to leak the information early beforehand to try to jeopardize this, this potential momentous decision. Um, and this goes back to what I mentioned earlier in the presentation, Xi Jinping's use of anti-corruption purges to consolidate power. You know, Xi Jinping has two main tools for inspiring, uh, to consolidate his personalized control over the party in China. You inspire fervor and you inspire fear. And I think fear, unfortunately, is probably the more compelling of the two factors. And we've seen it continue to today. To today, anti-corruption purges have brought on just today on my phone, I've seen plenty of headlines about further officials getting punished. One of them was, I think, uh, a former assistant minister of the Ministry of Public Security. This is 11th, 12th year of Xi Jinping's leadership. You know, the, the, the anti-corruption purges have not abated. Uh, the use of these purges to enforce discipline and fear, and therefore consolidate the leaders' authority has only continued. It would be a, I would, you know, this is obviously speculation, but I think it would have been a very brave person within the leadership to step out of line and say, why do you think I do, you're doing this wrong? Because you're therefore exposing yourself to retaliation, exposing yourself to uh, being targeted by Xi Jinping through the very awesome use of force he's done. By that point, he had been doing it for more than five years. So the examples have already been made clear uh, it, that though that execution of his power, I think, was the key in making sure no one there stepped off line to oppose it. Okay, sorry. Uh, next questions come from Norman Stockland from Scotland, uh, Aberdeen area, I think. Um, the question is about whether the top level officers, the three top officers, could be fragmented again or separated again moving forward. Or do you see them as being impossible to separate any longer? And in personal procedures for replacing them one by one, would that still be an option? Does that come into your succession? Uh, nothing is forever, I would say. Uh, it's a trite answer, but I think, uh, I think basically in the book, I actually go into a bit more depth about this, which is uh, can the system of governance that Xi Jinping set up survive him. And in the, the, my presentation just now talked about the mechanics of succession, but it actually closely related to this idea. Like if you choose the successor that is not able to be strong enough to defend your legacy, by, this, by the same token, this person cannot wield control over the bureaucracy, you know, tensions within the party will emerge, he may get deposed, people who oppose the Xi program of the past 10, 15, 20 years, whenever he decides to hand over power, would try to repudiate him or at least water down or dilute some of the worst excesses that they, they, they believe to have been implemented under the previous leadership. We've seen this happen before, uh, after the Mao era. So Mao Zedong died and Deng Xiaoping over the course of you know, the 80s steadily dismantled some of the key tenets of Maoism and put forward his own program. And there's no reason why uh, if Xi Jinping doesn't choose a successor who is strong enough to defend his uh, program and defend his vision of government, that another batch of leaders can't dismantle what Xi Jinping has set up. It is, it, and I, I'm quite sure Xi Jinping understands this as well because he saw this process unfold before his own eyes. He was part of this process. His family was affected. His father was affected. So uh, there is no reason why the current setup where you have the the three positions essentially completely bounded into one person with no term limits, forcing him to give up one position earlier than the rest. There's no reason why a future leadership def, you know, decided that this uh, approach to leadership is outdated. We need to revert to something you know, more akin to separation of powers where you have different persons holding the presidency and the general secretary position and the premiership, which was something that was, that was actually the case in the eighties. There's no reason why another generation of leadership won't come to the conclusion. But uh, what Xi Jinping can do to avoid this outcome is to make sure, from his perspective, choose the right guy to take over and defend his vision of governance for as long as possible. He can't really make sure... Uh, the, the only way he can uh, increase the chance of this happening is to make sure he handles succession well. 
He cannot guarantee it. He can only improve the odds from his perspective. Okay, let's move on. Um, next questions come from Lisa, which is to ask you about your thoughts on what is so unique or special about Xi Jinping's three-year-long policy towards the COVID pandemic. What was special about it? Is, is that the question? What, what well, the question special? is, what is so unique or special about Xi Jinping's approach to the COVID pandemic? Mm, I'm, I'm not sure I, I would... Let me answer the question this way. Um, I think it was revealing in how it was dismantled. Um, I think it was revealing of the nature of the governance and the, his use of uh, fear as a tool of governance. I think it was revealing of the impact it had on policymaking and decision-making down the chain. Um, so zero COVID obviously was effective for you know, the, the, the earlier, the majority of the three years, the first you know, two thirds of that period, it was effective in doing what the leadership wanted to do, which is to contain the pandemic, contain the coronavirus and restore to a large degree normal life for a lot of Chinese citizens in cities where infection rates were very low or non-existent. And for the most part, people could go about their lives as if there was no pandemic going on in the rest of the world. And that for a lot of Chinese was proof of, you know, the superiority of the system, the effectiveness of Chinese Communist Party governance. It was touted as, you know, See, China can do something better than all these Western countries that had a lot the, let the virus run wild. Um, but in the after Omicron emerged, you know, it really challenged the ability of the system to contain the virus in such a way. And eventually, um, for a long time, it was not a secret to the leadership. They understood as well as anybody else, because people have been talking about for a long time, was that they needed to start preparing the exit because you cannot do this forever. Um, and the way to prepare for an exit is to start vaccinating, ramp up vaccination numbers. To be fair, vaccination rates were quite high, uh, but the problem is like sort of the last mile delivery, right? Because you had successfully vaccinated the vast majority of the population, but the people that you really need to vaccinate, the people most vulnerable to the reopening, uh, the elderly and the vulnerable population, they were sort of discouraged from vaccinating because there was a period of time where the government narrative was that if you have preconditions, you have if you're old, you have certain medical conditions, you should avoid vaccinations because you could uh, exacerbate those problems. You may suffer side effects. So it became when the time came, the crunch time to drive up vaccination among the vulnerable population, they couldn't really do it. There was still this gap. Uh, they had to overcome sort of the psychological barrier they set up themselves. Um, and also, I think when the policy was dismantled, a lot of officials hadn't actually really followed through on the vaccination drive because if you're a local official, you have been preparing for the last three years to clamp down on any outbreaks as they happened, lock down districts, lock down house compounds, you know, send people into quarantine centers with you know, almost no um, exemptions. That sort of high intensity uh, approach requires time and resources and manpower. And even if the center was starting to send you signals, say like we should start preparing for an exit, we need to start driving up vaccinations. You are in, from a local official's point of view, which one is likely to get me into trouble? If I start allow, transitioning people, money and resources into vaccinating people and start diluting my capability to contain the virus, I could get fired tomorrow if an outbreak happens in my district. The risk, the, the, the downside risk of such a shift is very high for a local official who's being held accountable for his mistakes. And they've seen it happen many times. A lot of officials were punished for quote unquote negligence, uh, failure to execute their duty when it came to uh, pandemic controls. So if, if you tell me, I have the same time, I have to maintain strict zero COVID controls and transition to preparation for a post pandemic future by vaccinating people, and I only have certain limited number of resources and manpower to do it. The choice is simple. I would still pr primarily focus on the former, which is to contain the virus because preparing, vaccinating people won't defend my job. The, the, the effects are sort of amorphous. It's not really easy to uh, define success apart from vaccination rates, but it's very easy to define failure if an uh, outbreak happens in my district. So a lot of officials clearly did not start preparing. Hospitals were not stock stocked with the right medicines. Vaccine, vaccination drives were not probably executed. 
because I think for a lot of officials down the line, under the high pressure top down approach that Xi Jinping has instituted, the choice you know between self preservation and is very clear. They they gravitate towards the conservative safer choice, and that directly affected the ability of the center to shift course and prepare for a post pandemic future. And that contributed, I think, quite directly to the sort of very chaotic exit that we all saw in late 2022, early 2023. Okay, I want to move on more quickly. I got, we got four minutes, three minutes left. I got two more okay. questions. Mm -hmm. I'll try to see whether we can squeeze in both, but at least one of them. And mm -hmm. the next one comes from Jonathan Fenby. Clear, short, straightforward question. Does picking a successor automatically weakened an autocratic leader? Uh, to some extent, I think it does because you, you people start aligning themselves with the successor. Um, insofar, so obviously this depends on the quality of the successor. If the successor is a good one in the sense that he's capable, he has ability, he has a strong ability to organize and do his own political base, you are weakening the leader because you are starting to siphon away authority and influence from the incumbent. If you use a weak successor, that process may be a bit you know, slower. He may not be able to siphon as much power and influence from you, but you are undermining your true goal in succession, which is to make sure the next guy can actually do what you want him to do because he may get end up getting ousted very quickly. So in some ways, it's you, you can't have it both ways. You, you, you choose a good successor, he's almost always going to start weakening your authority. You use a bad successor. He may not immediately weaken your authority, but longer term, what you truly want to achieve, that gets undermined. So unfortunately, I think th that's why it's called the successor's dilemma. You know, you, you can't have it both ways. Okay, let me try to see, if we, we, we can squeeze in the last question you come uh, pop in two from University of Sydney. I'm not completely sure I get the questions, so do forgive me if I misunderstood the, uh, you, Mr. Chu. The question is about your analysis of in the book and how does that relate to the politics of China in Hong Kong and in Singapore? Now, I'm not sure whether it's about Chinese politics or Chinese policy mm. worse. Well, there's no Chinese politics in Singapore because we are a sovereign nation with our own system of government. <laughs> uh, but in Hong Kong, uh, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but I think in terms of I want to actually do describe in the book about Hong Kong is I think Hong Kong, uh, there's a clear sense that they had let the problem fester for too long. Uh, they had allowed successive waves of resistance play out over the years since 97. Uh, I talked to um, some of you who know who he is, Bernard Chan, who's like sort of a, a prominent voice for the poor establishment camp. He himself described it to me as uh, we did economic integration, we did uh, other forms of integration, but we didn't do political integration. And they kicked that can down the road too far. And that meant we had, you know, waves of protests. Um, you know, there was a period of law, you know, after the 2003 Article 23 protests, but, you know, they saw it crop up again in 2012 with the um, National Ed Moral Education protests, 2014 with the um, uh, Umbrella Movement. So, Successive ways of protest reemerged again in the early 2010s. And I think they increasingly took on a flavor which from Beijing's perspective was anti their authority, anti-communist party authority. And they realized they could not be reconciled anymore. Uh, either you had to start taking more decisive action or this thing could grow to something that truly gets out of your control. So I think by 2019, given the massive scale of the protest, given the direct assault on symbols of central government authority, uh, it truly galvanized Beijing and we're taking really drastic action. There, there was no, you know, two ways about it now. Either we act and solve this problem once and for all. And I believe some Chinese officials, based on what I've heard from conversations people in the know, is that, you know, they privately some of them talk about a second handover. You know, the first handover, we did the basic stuff. The second handover, we must do it once and for all. This will not happen again. We must get this right. You know, there's no second chances. We do this uh, once and do it good. And that's what we've seen subsequently happen, you know, NSL, Article 23. And then from that perspective, um, there's no questioning their commitment to delivering, you know, impressing upon Hong Kong society that Beijing is truly in charge. Okay. On that note, I'm afraid 
it is my duty to draw these webinars to a close. Thank you very much, Chun Han Wang, for your very insightful, interesting um, presentation and answers. And thank you to all of you, you who have raised questions. I'm glad that I have managed to put them all to Mr. Huang. I look forward to seeing more of you in some other events that we host moving forward. Thank you and goodbye.